Welcome everybody to this multi-asset segment. Uh, my name is Paul Kalagiru, Client Portfolio Manager for the multi-asset solutions business here in Hong Kong. Um, we're going to do a panel discussion, a one-on-one -on -one discussion first, um, and then we're going to throw it open to Q&A. Um, with me today is our key speaker, Luke Brown, Head of Asset Allocation in Asia. Um, given the time that we've got, um, a short time frame, I think we should kick straight off. Um, Luke, would you mind um, just giving us a, a market review, a market recap of where we've been in 2020? It's been a particularly difficult year macroeconomically. Maybe you can set the scene um, where we've been and where we're at um, currently. Over to you. Yeah, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Paul. Thank you for that. So, <clears throat> look, I think 2020 has been an extraordinary year for anybody that has managed to avoid the press, avoid markets, you'd be forgiven for thinking, well, what has happened? Um, if we look at equity markets where they are today, they're at higher levels than they were at the beginning of the year. So it would seem that nothing has happened. However, for me as an investor and, and having been in the markets over the entire course of the year and, and watched how things have evolved, it's been one of the most extraordinary years of my investment career. Um, <clears throat> If we think about what's happened, I, I do believe understanding the journey that we've been on is foundational in trying to unpick what the future might look like. We can look at a timeline of 2020. And broadly speaking, you know, we started the year in, in a relatively risk on environment that was very encouraging. We had US and China signing trade agreements and everything seemed to be going well. Unfortunately, we then hit the coronavirus pandemic. Now, at the time, it was unclear what the impact was going to be, but very quickly, this became the dominant driver of risk in markets. And we saw some extraordinary policy action taking place. As we got through February and March, the story turned from one of coronavirus into what action is going to be taken. And in particular, all eyes turned to the Fed. And we saw <coughs> emergency rate cuts we saw stimulus packages, the likes of which we had never seen before being introduced. And critically for me, and what formed the, the base of markets and allowed us to recover, was the fact that we actually saw emerging coordinated action, not just from the Fed, but from the ECB, from the Bank of England, from others. So this led to extraordinary packages coming out through April and June. And as we got into June, with the ECB announcing a 750 billion recovery fund, the Fed concurrently started purchasing corporate bonds. This drew a line under spread widening. This gave huge opportunities for investment in investment grade and high yield credit. As we started to understand more about the impact of, of coronavirus and possibilities from emerging from this dire situation, including extraordinary responses um, from the scientists around the world searching for a vaccine, <clears throat> we started to get a lot more momentum in towards risk assets and dramatic recoveries, particularly in developed market equities. At the same time, we did see that there was a sort of prevailing risk off environment of people concerned about how to position portfolios. And I think that was very well reflected in the very strong returns that we saw from gold, adding a diversifier and a degree of risk mitigation into portfolios with gold touching almost $2,000 per ounce. Now, having gone through all of this, um, we then find additional uncertainty coming into markets. And if one thing that markets do not like, it is uncertainty. And this, I think, manifested itself in uh, September and October through concerns and questions over what the outcome of the US election might be. Would it be the blue wave? Would it be Biden and the Democrats, which arguably would have led to um, a dramatic increase in stimulus packages, turning on the taps, if you will, further liquidity, further support for risk assets, or would Trump prevail? <clears throat> Through November, as the results started coming in and towards where we find ourselves today, became clear that Trump had failed in his attempts to be re-elected. And we now embrace a Democratic president um, under Joe Biden, but at the same time, absent the blue wave. So where we find ourselves today is that it's a good environment for risk assets. We have seen a dramatic recovery, as you can see from the chart in front of you. And as I said at the outset, you know, if you hadn't been aware of all of these things going on over the course of the year, you would be forgiven for thinking it was just another year in equity markets. Thanks, Luke. Um, maybe we can take a step back um, and maybe we can just walk through our asset allocation um, forecasts um, and how those components that go into that research process 
um, sort of interplay with each other. Um, and maybe you can highlight what preferences that we have geographically and by sectors that we have uh, currently and where, where we're positioned and what we like. Yes, certainly. And the, the forecasting process that we follow is, is one that um, I, I, I personally hold great stock in as one that has been developed and evolved over a number of years. Manulife has a huge heritage in constructing long-term multi-asset portfolios. And that process of, of understanding what potential asset classes could be, returns could be and the drivers of those returns is foundational in the way we think about constructing portfolios. So <clears throat> if we just look first of all at how we expect those asset classes to evolve um, over the course of the next five years, <clears throat> so five years is, is the sort of central element of, of where we think about our forecasting process. So to start with, um, if we look at the returns that we might get in the sort of large cap world, and this is dominated by North America, what we can see here is that US large cap in particular offers lower returns than we think will be received elsewhere um, in the investment spectrum. So particularly looking at mid cap, small cap, um, Canada is a standout. Going a little bit further away from North America, if we start going into Europe, <coughs> Asia emerging markets. This tells a different tale. And this is the belly, I would say, of, of our overall forecasting process. And what I hope you can see from this chart in front of you is that there remain attractive investment opportunities across Europe, which is more value driven than growth driven, <clears throat> across through into emerging markets. A lot of this driven by our views on US dollar and potential weakness. So those are the areas I think offer attractive returns. Now, moving a little bit further on, and obviously this is more dominated by equities, we can start to look at the fixed income world. And what we see here to the right hand side of the chart, compressed returns from fixed income. Just a fact for you, Paul, because I know you like my factoids. There is something like $18 trillion of debt with negative interest rates. This is not fixed income, this is fixed loss. OK, so when you think about constructing portfolios from these forecasts, what you can see here is that there are attractive opportunities in Asia, in emerging markets, <coughs> in select parts of the credit spectrum. In particular, I would call out here leverage loans, EMD, high yield bonds. So that's how we're seeing things evolving for the next five years. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. Um, maybe we can move on to thematics. Uh, maybe you can just maybe give us some key investment themes, um, given their, the environment that we're in, and, and maybe highlight any um, changes in your thinking process or the MAST multi-asset solutions team's thinking process, uh, which have arisen as a result of the, the pandemic. Yeah, look, this, is, this is a great question, Paul, and it's one that we wrestle with consistently on our investment calls. Um, being a global team, I think that you know, we have the benefit of insight and experience <coughs> genuinely across the globe. So our North American colleagues, Europe, and of course, Asia, where we have a huge presence on the ground. Now, when we're thinking about themes and what might drive returns in portfolios um, driven from the returns you get in markets, I think <clears throat> there are certain things we need to look at. Now, COVID is going to continue to dominate how economies emerge from the pandemic, the delivery of vaccines. And we've already seen in the UK, for example, a very rapid approval and people are starting to be vaccinated how quickly this can be rolled out, how many people actually take it is going to drive sentiment and that will drive risk and that will drive path of markets. Now, in addition to this, I think, you know, if we compare and contrast how we've been positioned in recent history versus recent future, recent history has been dominated by developed markets. <clears throat> it's been dominated by the liquidity provisions that I talked about. It's been dominated by growth and tech outperforming. I think what we can see now is more of a migration towards the potential for value to outperform. And if you cast your mind back to the previous chart where I talked about the capital market assumptions, Europe, segments of Asia, that lends itself more to that kind of barbell approach in making sure that you're allocated to those right sectors and factors. Now, <clears throat> additionally to that, um, I would say that if you think about geographic positioning, and as I mentioned, portfolios were tilted much more towards the US, what we're looking at now is, I think, Asia in particular, emerging from um, the impacts of the coronavirus pandemic, 
more quickly and earlier. <clears throat> and that, again, gives us opportunity to tilt those portfolios that are able to take specific Asian exposure, be it through equities, be it through credit. Okay, thank you. Um, could we just move on to sort of market related and sort of looking into 2021? Um, I think we're, we're well aware of the key drivers for next year. It's either, it's either the, the Fed, the dollar, China, and the pathway of, of, of COVID and vaccine success. Could you maybe speak to a few of those key drivers for the, for the, for the next year? Well, I, I think you've pretty much hit the nail on the head there, Paul. Um, I, I think what I would add to that, though, is that for me, it boils down to two things. Okay? It boils down to risk and sentiment, and those two are very closely intertwined. I think if market participants become concerned over breaks in liquidity, and we could point to North America at the moment, we have a new president coming in. <clears throat> there are many debates taking place over what stimulus is going to be available, and arguably the baseline has been priced into markets. So any deviation from that could lead to increased volatility. I think the other thing that we need to look at as well is geopolitical risks and how they are evolving. We can look to Europe and the UK at the moment with the ongoing negotiations of Brexit. I, I was debating whether or not to refer to this as being 11th hour negotiations, but I think it, we're actually counting down the last 10 seconds to midnight. Um, I'm still hopeful that there will be some sort of deal, but obviously there needs to be movement on both sides. So I think looking at those emerging risks and potential geopolitical influences is going to be critical to understanding how markets might evolve. Um, can we maybe touch upon the whole cyclical versus sort of value discussion? I know it's something that we're having within our team at the, at the moment. Um, we've had sort of that great leadership from, from growth-oriented um, sectors and tech sectors over the year. Can you maybe talk about, you know, are we approaching that inflection point where value-oriented sectors and markets are becoming uh, more important for investors to look at, or are we sort of still firmly in that sort of growth camp? Yeah, look, it, this is the question of greatest debate, I would say, and um, certainly within our team. Now, as you say, growth has dominated. In a zero interest rate world, that makes complete sense because this is where you want to be to attempt to benefit <coughs> from um, you know, potential capital returns. However, given, I think, the aggressive returns that growth has delivered, growth and tech in particular, given the very attractive valuations that we see in certain segments of the market, and also, I think, given the momentum and that word sentiment again that is coming out, and we have seen a dramatic reversal of that relationship, growth versus value over the past six months, some 15% compression between and the, the relative returns of, of those two factors. So I think that will continue. I would urge investors to be cautious, be selective, okay, because it's not immediately obvious to me that there is a single dominant driver of returns in markets. We have to continually assess the new information we get. We have to look for signals that are coming out to, to position ourselves there. But I'm cautiously optimistic that those more value-driven areas, whether it is European stocks, whether it is Japan, and, and look at the performance of Japan over the past few months, though those are, I suppose, the green shoots, if you will, of the recovery of valuation. Okay. Um, now, we've, we've flashed up a, a slide previously in terms of our strategic allocations, and um, maybe you could just walk through those asset class preferences that we have, which are obviously founded upon our our strategic views, um, maybe you can walk us through that in terms of um, ideas for investors of where they should be, should be positioned? Yeah, so the, the chart you have in front of you here, and, and these are our strategic perspectives, so again, five-year views, and, and this is translating that previous chart, those capital market assumptions, into how you want to think about constructing your portfolios. And broadly speaking, in um, equity space, what you can see here, the green bars are overweight, and it is tilting our portfolios more towards emerging markets and Asia. Now, within Asia in particular, we like Hong Kong from a strategic perspective over China. Um, <clears throat> now, 
on the fixed income side, however, and, you know, I've always I've already given my sort of throwaway comments over things being fixed lost. You know, we would typically be underweight U.S. government debt. Um, rates are extremely low. They are likely to stay low for a, for a long time. But ultimately, normalization must occur, or we hope must occur, um, perhaps even within that five-year framework. So avoiding government debt and tilting those portfolios, again, selectively to those areas where we think you can get attractive returns and are compensated for the risk you're taking on. So look to emerging markets, look to global credit, look to EMD. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. Um, now, yes, yeah, sorry, you've the got balance is, sorry, for it, the, the balance it. to this, of course, is the tactical side. Hmm. Um, so, you know, we don't just construct portfolios and, and buy and hold over five years. Um, typically, we, we would look to um, nimbly adjust those portfolios based on our shorter term views. And this tells a different picture. So if we look at here at this slide, what you can see is that from a short term perspective in equities, we go back to U.S. Um, markets. And the reason we do that is because it is, as I said before, dominated by that liquidity framework that we see, potential for further stimulus. So there is value to be had there. But again, <clears throat> Asia emerging. You can, you can see a story emerging here. In fixed income space, <clears throat> similarly, rotating out of government bonds, taking more credit exposure and specifically on a regional basis focusing on Asia. Asia really for me is is the story that we're going to have um, through 2021 and beyond. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, maybe we can sort of open up the floor to questions. Um, what I and yeah please do send your questions through and um, through the through the QA function. Um, the first question I have here is in relation to ESG. Um, it's clearly an important theme um, which has been building over the years and more important maybe um, this year. Um, Luke, maybe you can just highlight how ESG has been further embedded into our multi-asset um, strategy and solutions business. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and look, ESG. So this is going to influence the way we manage money, the way we think about investing. Uh, and it's clear and, you know, I think one of the positive effects, if you will, of, of the COVID pandemic is people focusing on investing for good, if you want to frame it that way. Now, at Manulife, we are fully committed to embracing ESG. Um, I think from our colleagues in equities and fixed income are very well advanced and fully embedding ESG criteria in the way they think about stock selection and security selection. Now, from a multi-asset point of view, we're doing a huge amount of work here at the moment. Um, I would describe it as combining that bottom-up security selection ESG framework with a top-down asset allocation framework. And approaches that we are considering at the moment is also looking at those forward-looking capital market assumptions and taking into account ESG criteria. OK, and then from a portfolio construction point of view, you can start to think about whether you want to isolate or avoid <clears throat> certain sectors that screen poorly and therefore might not offer the returns that you would normally expect absent that ESG screening framework. So there is a huge amount of work going on here and I'd look forward to updating in the coming months. Yeah, great. Um, we have a question here on vaccines. Um, if vaccines become widely available, and the economy, the global economy, um, starts to recover, um, would you think equity would be preferred as an asset class? And then as a follow-up to that, um, what's the place for um, Asia fixed income also in, in investor portfolios in terms of the credit side? Okay, that's a great question. So, vaccines. Um, the jury's kind of out on this one for me. We, we are seeing vaccines being released, and there's, there's a lot of fanfare, obviously, and you know, I have to take my hat off to the scientific community to, to develop a vaccine in such short order is unprecedented. Um, now, <clears throat> whilst vaccines are being rolled out, I think everybody should understand that the volume of vaccines available, i.e. how many people can you actually inoculate, <clears throat> is still being understood. Um, if I look at the UK as, a, as an example, um, I think realistically we're looking until June before we are getting to a point where there has been mass opportunity for vaccination across the population. I stress opportunity. The reason for that is having vaccines available does not mean 
that people are going to be vaccinated. I think we need to look through the data here and we need to understand how vaccines are being accepted um, by the, the sort of global population. Now, notwithstanding that, the reality is having vaccines available, having them distributed allows economies to open up. With the stimulus packages we have, with the abundant liquidity that we have, <clears throat> the more vaccinations that take place, the less impact COVID has, <clears throat> the more encouraging it is for the opening up of markets. So yes, I would expect this to drive a risk on environment for equities, but again, be selective. It doesn't necessarily across a, uh, apply across the whole market. What we're seeing at the moment is more of what we would describe as, you know, this K-shaped emergence from the from the pandemic impact so we're seeing a lot of good growth in manufacturing in cyclicals we are seeing it less so in services for example so do watch that and then the second part of the question was around age of fixed income and where we see it and you know this, this is entirely consistent with the previous comments that i made you know a base case of US dollar weakness, we believe, is going to be constructive for Asian assets generally and Asia fixed income specifically. I think the opportunity set there to selectively take credit exposure in a thoughtful way through portfolios that are constructed bottom up securities selection. So select the right securities, not just market beta, and then combine those in a portfolio in, in a thoughtful and risk conscious way. Great. Um, maybe just bringing um, things closer to home, there's a question here on Hong Kong market. Um, maybe you can share your thoughts on Hong Kong, um, given we have a, an overweight in that particular market or a, or a positive view on that market. Maybe you can share your thoughts around Hong Kong. Yeah, look, I think, you know, Hong Kong markets have um, been a difficult place to be over the past few years. However, we have seen strong and attractive returns. Now, notwithstanding geopolitical risks and specifically how the world engages with China, what the Biden administration does with China, I think the very fact that, you know, Hong Kong is critical to the region, is critical to the potential growth and opening up of capital markets. And, you know, we could cite recent IPOs that have taken place of, of China's entities and also the opening up of and the legal and regulatory framework offers attractive opportunities. Now, as ever, <clears throat> you need to look through different lenses and make sure that allocation is suitable for your portfolios. But we do feel through looking at the potential returns that we could see in the Hong Kong markets, it is a good place to selectively invest and take risk exposure. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe we can end the uh, Q&A here and Maybe I can hand back to you, Luke, and just to give maybe three key messages uh, for our investors, for our viewers today, what are the sort of key takeaways you'd like them to take away with today? Yes, yeah, certainly. So, look, to, to wrap all of this up, and I, I hope, you know, everybody that's, that's tuned in has, has found some insights in there that, that help frame their investment decisions and thinking about allocating. But if I could choose just three things, to watch and take note of over the start of 2021 and see how things emerge. The first is the path of the US dollar. Is the US dollar going to go on more of a weakening bias? If so, that is likely to be more constructive for those Asian and indeed emerging markets. <clears throat> so watching US dollar currency is essential. Um, if you want to dig a little bit deeper into that, I think you need to start looking at and some of the liquidity profiles and the availability of US dollars and our macro research team have done a huge amount of, of very good research that's informing our views here. The second one is what we touched on earlier, equity factor rotation. What part of the equity market do you want to be invested in? <clears throat> Should you be barbelled as we kind of are in portfolios at the moment, making sure we neither miss out on ongoing growth momentum and strength but equally their question over valuation, cyclicals, etc. Okay, so watch to see how that emerges because it is going to inform where you want to tilt your portfolios. And then the final one would be around risk and volatility. Okay, in particular, geopolitical risks. I mentioned in the context of why Hong Kong is attractive for us, <clears throat> but I also think 
you know, from an investor's point of view and thinking about the risk you have in your portfolios, watching to see how negotiations go in Europe with the UK, watching to see how the Biden administration behaves in the first few months. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. Um, and thank you, everybody. I think we'll end our discussions here. Thank you very much. Um, guys on screen, please respond to the survey questions that are on screen. That'll be very helpful to us. Um, I hope 2020 ends very strongly. Um, and I bid you all a healthy and wealthy um, 2021. Thank you all. Thank you.